Okay, so welcome everyone uh, to the Virtual Institute for Public Knowledge at NYU. My name is Eric Kleinenberg. I'm a professor of sociology and also a director of the IPK. Uh, we're a part of the university that uh, tries to bring people together from different schools and different fields, uh, different universities and, and from outside the university as well. Uh, we generate a lot of original research um, with team projects that are designed to focus on uh, you know, big issues for the city and, and nation uh, and occasionally the world as well. Uh, and we also try to do a lot of convenings where we bring people together uh, to spark conversations that might not otherwise happen. We did a lot of work like this uh, in the aftermath of Sandy years ago, uh, based on the idea that uh, when a, a city experiences a major event, especially a traumatic event, it's not clear where people can go to process you know, what's happening think about what we've learned and where we go from here. Uh, and that wound up being a really productive experience for all of us at IPK and in the university community generally. And we've decided to do something uh, similar uh, with the current pandemic. And so we got some support from uh, the university's cross-cutting initiative on inequality. And this is the third in a series of six conversations uh, featuring NYU faculty talking about a, a range of issues that have come up around the pandemic and the future uh, of, of life after the pandemic. Today's conversation's about the future of public goods. And I have to say, it's a conversation that's probably going to be different uh, given what's just happened this week in the US federal government than it might have been had we done it a few weeks before. Uh, we're really into some new territory here with some kind of surprising developments uh, in the American welfare state and the provision of public goods. And it's extraordinary, you know, we think about the contingencies of history, just how consequential uh, those elections in Georgia turned out to be, you know, not to mention the, the, the bigger election in November, uh, you know, with literally one uh, change in the outcome of the Senate election, we'd be well, looking at a very different political reality. Uh, yet here we are uh, with uh, kind of a, in the aftermath of this extraordinary uh, bill for $1.9 trillion uh, that's probably going to change a lot in the way we talk about public goods, uh, whether we're talking about city and state programs that will have funding because there's a lot of money for cities and states, uh, or whether we're talking about things like uh, you know public health and health care, uh, potentially even housing. So the way we're going to do this tonight is we have four speakers who are going to speak for oh, eight to 10 minutes or so. Uh, I'll introduce them in a moment. Uh, then I might ask some questions and we're going to open it up We'll, um, have, uh, we'll have everybody uh, out of their uh, uh, Zoom space and into the next room in their house, the living room, the kitchen table, uh, wherever it is that you go when you turn away from, the, the, from this machine uh, around six o'clock. Uh, last thing I wanna tell you is that if you have a question you'd like to raise, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. We won't get to it till the end of the session, uh, but we will see it. So uh, the speaking order tonight is first, uh, we're gonna hear from LaRue Lewis McCoy, who's an associate professor in the sociology of education program uh, at NYU Steinhardt School. Uh, his first book is called Inequality in the Promised Land, Race, Resources, and Suburban Schooling. And he's been working on a big ethnographic project uh, in the Westchester uh, community uh, for some time now. And we're really excited to have, uh, have LaRue here with us. Then we're going to hear from uh, Ingrid uh, Gould Ellen, who is a professor in the Wagner School of Public Policy. Ingrid is an expert on housing. She's also the uh, director of the Furman Center uh, at NYU uh, and you know, teaches in the urban planning program. Really one of the great experts on kind of national housing uh, issues uh, in the US and many other things as well. Uh, we're then going to hear from my colleague in sociology, uh, Alex uh, Barnard, who is an uh, assistant professor uh, working on health and uh, the mental health system. Uh, he looks at the United States, but also uh, does research intensively in France and is always useful for offering some comparative perspective, uh, you know, what kinds of things make our system distinctive here uh, and what can we learn from other models. Um, and then we're gonna hear from my colleague, jean paul Bauchi, who's a professor of sociology and also a professor uh, in the Gallatin School and the director of the Urban Democracy Lab uh, with, with uh, which we partner often at IPK. And jean paul has uh, really been uh, flexing his muscles as a public sociologist in the past year, uh, 
uh, you know, trying to do research, but also generate uh, policy ideas, um, some of which have uh, some exciting legs uh, moving right now. And I'm sure that Jean Paul will talk about that. So, with no further ado, uh, I'm going to turn things over to LaRue and uh, off we go. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you for the warm introduction and excited to be in a conversation with the co-panelists here in this virtual space and everyone who's in the room. So I, uh, my comments aren't as structured as I would prefer them to be, but that's kind of also a reflection of the state that we're in. So there are three things that I wanna cover, bring up today around COVID-19 and public goods. Uh, the first is to think about how we've conceptualized this pandemic as a problem, right? So a year ago, we were literally in the moment where many of the public institutions and many dimensions of our lives were moving from public to private spaces. So that may have been the shuttering of schools, that may have been for those who have the luxury of being afforded uh, middle class and above jobs to work from home. It may have been also a discussion around how we even think about how the virus uh, pathology actually worked where the virus was, where it wasn't, and how we contracted it, and folks walking around with rubber gloves on and non-mask or staying inside. But there was this big moment in which the pandemic brought forward a problem for people in literally how they live their everyday lives. But I think in the midst of that, what was birthed in particular was also the reemergence and the clear statement of ethnic bias. And we saw it through the dimensions of policy. We saw with the 45th president an insistence on international students remaining present in the United States or functionally being excommunicated. We saw the rise and the continued presence of hate crimes against uh, people of Asian descent. We saw in particular that the pandemic went from problem to actually a lens of motion when we realized disproportionately that Black, Latinx, and Native folks were dying at the hands of COVID-19 that it was the medical apartheid that we saw in the healthcare system. It was a compounding of factors that we had seen that led to these disproportionate rates. And quickly for me, as a black man in America, I started to watch the fractured response, not just at the federal level, but at the state level, as people started to push to open back up, to look for normalcy amidst chaos. And that pandemic as problem uh, leads me to thinking about how we understand sometimes how a crisis emerges in a moment, but it can also be extinguished, right? So in many ways, COVID became not necessarily a crisis, but it became a way in which people started to normalize and work around. So how can you make it to that meeting? Zoom. How can you lead a normal life? Flee the city. How can you, right? So instead of dealing with the actual crisis, we escaped it. And so the pandemic shifted from something that was more about a problem, but something that reproduced the structures of inequity that we had. Those who had more means were able to enact them. So we saw that in the case of schools in particular. It was this movement where we saw the emergence of the pandemic pod. And the pandemic pod was a structure that was developed for those who had the means of a small number of uh, uh, students from three to five students functionally receiving private education. And we saw for families that were most vulnerable, economically vulnerable, uh, uh, families that were packed into physical communities and buildings that were small, uh, not having the ability to engage those pods, but being forced into online portals, being forced to do schoolwork through a cell phone connection, being forced to try to return to some form of normalcy without ever addressing the underlying problems. And for me, I saw that the reproduction moment uh, came to its height amidst uh, a summer of uprisings. So we think, of course, of the uh, the, arising, uh, the uprisings around the death of George Floyd, our awareness of the killings of Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor. But still, even in that moment, as we saw the single largest uprising of people in the United States in a continuous form in urban history, many folks said, well, then what comes next, right? We even saw as people were in the streets, the question was, well, what's the policy solution? I wanna offer sometimes that policy is not a solution to the problems that we face. It is simply a way to address some inequity, but it goes away from the roots or the causes that we actually need to uh, try to think about that are larger and structural. And for me, I see this typified when we think about our schools, whether they're open, or whether they're closed, right? As a New York City resident, we were on the front end of having a conversation of whether our school should be open or closed. And sets of parents, particularly, uh, well-resourced white women came together to say, look, the evidence tells us our schools are safe. We see it in New York. We see it in San Francisco. We see it in Chicago. And disproportionately, those folks who have taken up the lion's share of attention 
and talking about safety are the ones who are least vulnerable to begin with. And as black residents, as brown residents, as poor residents raise the question and say, our schools were never safe. How could they be safe? Even if they were ostensibly safe from COVID itself, these were sites of extreme discrimination and inequity, they remain silenced, right? We have found new ways to innovate and dismantle a notion of problem, but recreate inequity. And I, and I hope that we can recognize that in our evolution over this one year time period, that we are now pushing into a third space, right? And there have been some folks who've talked about the pandemic as possibility or the pandemic as portal. And I want it to be a portal, but I think for it to be a portal or a possibility, we really have to do uh, some unlinking of our imagination of where we are uh, from, uh, uh, we actually have to pull apart where we are from where we've been and where we're going. Yes, we've had a shift in the federal government. Yes, we've had a shift in leadership, which I wholly appreciate, which will lead to a much more coordinated response. But will it upend much of the inequity that we've seen? Probably not. Am I excited about the prospect of a credit for low income families? Absolutely. But I was excited about it 15 years ago when it got brought to the table, right? So there are the evolutions of inequity that we have. And so as we sit on this moment of possibility, some of us are saying now that we're coming out of the pandemic, now that we've gotten vaccinated, now that things are opening back up, that we've actually moved past it. But I want to suggest that uh, Christina Sharp, who is a, a scholar in uh, Toronto, talks about being in the wake. At best, we're in the wake of this pandemic, meaning that we stand in the aftermath of a thing, but still it is current. Some of us are submerged beneath the water, while some of us have our heads above water, while other folks are literally still on the boat. I think about the forms of racial violence that emerged early on and crystallized towards Asian communities. They've continued and they are spiking. I think about the ways that many folks talked about the emergence and the fast tracking of the COVID vaccine, but still the gross inequity of actual access. Looking in my own neighborhood, seeing affluent white individuals take up slots for the vaccine. I think about the ways in which we can think about living in a post COVID world, but we have really underestimated the consequences of communities that have been locked away from schooling, not just for a year, but for decades the consequences of communities that have multi-generational households. And so I'll leave here uh, and, 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 and offer that. I think we can learn something in thinking about the impacts of COVID and actually looking at the biomedical dimensions, particularly of those folks who are COVID long haulers. Having several family members who contracted COVID and live day to day with the consequences, I realize that often they're unable medically to pinpoint what exactly has caused the harm and every set of interventions that they offer to COVID long haulers usually do something to try to placate pain, but do nothing to get to the roots. Our policy is much like that when I think about how we are approaching this moment. And I hope as we think about what are our public goods, be they schools, be they uh, medicine, be they actual safety that is provided in and outside of communities, that we recognize that if we're not careful in our excitement, and our possibility of having a different government, all we'll do is slowly paint over deep scars and slowly cover up things that have had long histories that we're often unwilling to grapple with. Thanks, Lou. That's a, a terrific and um, uh, you know pr provocative opening for this. Uh, we've clearly seen a lot of other you know recent experiences where one would think there's a clear lesson and a clear set of policy responses. Uh, and in fact, what happens next is really different. You know, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about cities and disasters. And so Katrina is, for, is that kind of story for me. You know, it looked like there was a clear lesson from Katrina, but uh, we didn't exactly solve those issues. I do want to ask you, though, since we are in this kind of moment of production and possibility and surprising things are happening in the policy arena, have you seen anything in the education world uh, that gives you the sense that that maybe there is a, an opportunity to deal not just with the year that was lost for low in, for low income students who are studying on phones and you know deprived of the opportunity to join a pod or go to a private school um, but is there is, are there places that are taking a deeper look at the education system and really trying to deal with the fundamentals yeah so the biggest challenge is i often don't see those as systematic interventions 
-hmm. I see particular schools and particular educators and leadership, but I can't point you to a city where I would say, you know what, they've taken on the challenge of not simply learning loss, right? So learning loss, even as a concept has been co-opted by neoliberalism. So techs, uh, book companies and Pearson and learning companies are saying, we can fix your learning loss problem. And many cities are going to these very folks who are providing services that never fundamentally ask, well, what's happening to our students? I think there's a lot of good work being done around trauma-informed education. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of grassroots communities, particularly in Chicago, have come together to figure out how to deal with issues of food insecurity and connection to education. And I think that if we are looking at more local levels, I, th I think if you take it a step beneath the city, you see some real possibilities in terms of engaging curriculum and building truly um, uh, anti-racist and culturally sustaining curricula. And that's the place where I would look. Yeah, thanks. I, you know, after the heat wave that I studied in Chicago, the city put together this amazing heat emergency plan, but they didn't have a segregation plan or a social isolation plan, uh, you know, or things like that. Uh, Ingrid, you're up. Thank you again, LaRue. Um, so yeah, Lauru, that was that was amazing. I mean, you said you were unprepared. That was just that was incredible. So um, they're um, really terrific, and actually, it um, resonates with some of what I want to talk about, which is sort of about this idea about sort of recreating inequity. Um, and and I and I want to talk about renters in particular, which is a lot of what I what I think about. And I think um, you know the pandemic really highlighted the degree of housing insecurity. Uh, in the United States, particularly um, among renters, and showed how few renters have savings to weather even minor right shocks to their incomes, minor shocks to sort of you know one their one healthcare bill away from from being evicted, um, and uh, you know so they can't you know weather these minor shocks, much less a, a global pandemic that virtually shuts down the economy entirely. Um, and, and this is in large part due to the fact that um, over time, housing costs have now, you know, now eat up um, a, a, a really alarming share of, of many renters' budgets. So just, you know, the share of renters paying what is sort of deemed as an, as an unsustainable amount of their income and rent has risen from, you know, less than a quarter in 1970 to nearly half today. Um, and, and that's really that's really a sea change. Um, and, and this is particularly true for households of color, right? This is particularly true um, for households of color who are more likely to rent in the first place because they've been shut out of opportunities to buy homes. Um, they are also more likely to be rent burdened for structural reasons and, and they are less likely to have savings that um, that are sufficient to enable them to weather these these short term shocks again due to long standing discrimination and 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 such instability is really and this gets to sort of the the, the public goods uh, aspect right such instability is really costly not only for those individuals right but for their children and for society right there's a large and growing body of research that now shows um, you know the association of, of housing instability with poor child outcomes it shows that um, and there is there's new kind of more, more causal work showing that evictions increase the risk of, of becoming homeless they increase they heighten residential instability they increase emergency room visits they decrease credit scores and um, and they reduce sort of durable consumption. Um, and, and of course, when, when landlords can't collect rent, they're going to struggle too, especially small landlords um, who just, you know, don't have the resources to manage the, the, um, the lack of rental income. And those small landlords are more likely to be households of color. Um, so, so I think there is a really um, important kind of public good aspect to housing that has been heightened by uh, the the pandemic and, and at least they're clearly positive externalities to, to, to providing assistance that let people that lets people stay in their homes. And, and you know, the Biden campaign proposed to make housing vouchers universal for low income um, renters. And I'm, you know, I'm I'm hopeful that we'll see that expansion. I I don't know that we're going to see that in the next year or two. There's um, 
there's you know a lot of political capital now has been has been spent but but what we are seeing in the meantime is this unprecedented level of support for emergency short term rental assistance which is um, you know absolutely essential when renters around the country now owe I mean the estimates range from like ten to fifty billion dollars and in or even seventy billion sorry like ten to seventy billion dollars in back rent and and right now over. 600 localities. I've been doing research on these emergency rental assistance programs around the country, and over 600 localities and states have now enacted, um, they've rent emergency, they've sort of stood up emergency rental assistance programs with support from the CARES Act, um, and, and then the more recent stimulus bill, and now they'll add to it with this, this uh, the, the bill that passed this week, and they've done amazing, amazing work, kind of standing up these um, these programs and getting assistance into the hands of vulnerable tenants. And um, in total, it's been about fifty billion dollars in support. But, and you know, and I hope going forward. I mean, I, I do think that um, you know that I'm somewhat optimistic that going forward will create kind of a a standing um, program to provide this kind of um, emergency assistance, recognizing that low income families face crises in their life. In their lives all the time, um, and uh, that put them at risk of losing their homes. Um, but, but I, but I want to underscore to sort of echo Larue's point is that it's not enough just to offer these programs, right? These emergency programs, just like more advantaged. You talked about sort of the affluent white um, people in your neighborhood being more likely, sort of, you know, getting the vaccine shots, right? Um, that, uh, you know, just like more advantaged individuals find their way to vaccines, it's also very likely that more the more advantaged among low-income renters are the ones that are going to find their way to this assistance. Um, and, and the landlords, right, um, that who are most likely to apply um, and receive this assistance are more likely to be uh, to, to be more advantaged. And, and, you know, it's still true that a minority, um, you know, a, a, excuse me, a majority of renters and needs don't even don't even know about these programs, um, despite how pervasive they are. And so I think the lesson is, is that, you know, we really need to pay attention to take up. Right. And that's something that we kind of we kind of think, OK, did this check the box. We passed this emergency. You know, Congress did this and there's all this money on the street. And it turns out, no. Right. First of all, it's a huge amount of work to stand up these programs, but then to make sure that they're equitable. And so one of the things um, not to mention that. Well, let me actually let me just say this first is that so without explicit efforts, I think that, you know, the assistance may not be distributed in a racially or economically um, equitable manner, and and from um, I've you know been involved now surveying and in a in research that's surveyed two over two hundred of these programs, and we've just did case studies of fifteen of them, and we've drawn out sort of a few lessons to to make the make sure that these rental assistance programs are more equitable. One is that funding allocation should be um, more equitable. Right now, you know, um, Congress basically in the statute distributed the money according to population. Well, you know, that's crazy, right? That's not about renters. I mean, not even about renters. And so, you know, in New York State, New York City got something like 17% of the New York State allocation, despite having, you know, over 70% of the rental assistance need and over 70% of the renters of color are in New York City. So in, within New York State. So, so that's critical. Um, and I hope that they'll you know, I, I, I actually think, and I need to go check that they corrected that in this um, this bill. It was sort of last minute, but they. Um, secondly, I think there, you know, there need to be efforts to sort of target, to explicitly target and prioritize um, vulnerable groups. Um, and through, you know, you can target particular neighborhoods. You can um, to target the, you know, lowest income households that really that really need um, need the assistance. And it critically three to invest in outreach and targeting, um, and really you know work with local nonprofits that are community based nonprofits that because um, a lot of sometimes the barriers are trust. Fourth, really important to simplify applications and documentation um, to uh, alleviate the administrative burden for households to apply, um, and um, and you know monitoring and, and making mid-course corrections along the way is obviously really critical to sort of keep up with the data and see who is it, are there gaps and in, in who's who's getting this assistance. And then and then finally I just also want to say that it's um to this point, to LaRue's point about, you know, this assistance is absolutely critical. Um, 
And I think it's going to have the potential to help stabilize a huge number of renters around the country, but it's not going to address the long standing, right, this sort of more secular decline in affordability that we have seen um, over the years and the fact that, um, you know, rising rents are really squeezing the, the budgets of, of so many um, renters around the country and particularly low income renters. So Thanks, I'll stop there. Well, I'm, I'm really happy that you brought up this, um, uh, you know, the issue about the cost of just kind of recovering from this particular crisis, yeah. how, just how expensive it has been yeah. uh, and how much goes unaddressed. If, you know, if you're just repairing the damage and you're in emergency mode, uh, you know, before the pandemic, we were all reading about just the capital costs for kind of getting NYCHA, for instance, yeah. uh, to where it needs to be, and it's tens of billions of dollars, or massive amounts of massive numbers. Yeah, Thirty billion, at least. And, 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 I, and I, I suppose the question here is, you know, well, one question is whether, you know, this is the beginning of a new approach uh, to, you know, to government governance and to an kind of investment in public goods generally. And you know, we start, we're, you know, we're opening up a tap, and sh and shifting gears. You know the kind of neoliberal moment is is ending, or whether this is a, a kind of desperation measure meant to cover something over so we can get back to the way that we were before. And I don't know how we can assess that. Yeah, no, I think that I think it is. It's a really good point. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Some of it is going to depend on sort of which way the political winds blow after this. Um, but I do think um, you know. I think look, rightfully so, the focus should be on getting the focus, you know, the attention to that has to be on the urgent and, and getting out of this crisis right now. But I think there, there are really two worries, right? That's what I'm saying, there are two kinds of inequities. One is that we have to make sure that even that assistance is delivered in an equitable manner. And you can't just, you know, sort of say, hey, the money's available and assume that it's gonna, because of all the structural inequality that that money then will not be allocated fairly, right? You've really got to be explicit about that. Um, and then there's the question of, okay, now we got everybody to where they were in 2019. Well, where they were in 2019 was really, yep. or February of 2020, that was really unequal. So um, you know, I think there were things, we, you know, that there are things, some sort of, you know, like the childcare credit that are sort of, that, that, got, that got into this bill that have the potential to address some of those, those structural yep. issues, but not so much, not as much in the housing side. It's more about the emergency. And, but I do hope that sort of builds a practice yep. that, um, and changes people's norms about housing assistance. I mean, here again, if I think about you know, my research over the last few decades on what happens in the aftermath of climate disasters, yeah. you have every reason to be skeptical that the money yeah. you allocate for emergency relief absolutely spent. I mean, you're hard pressed to find an area uh, where there's kind of more corruption and poor yeah. planning uh, and leveraging of political power to command resources, you yeah. know, than the billions of dollars that get spent in the aftermath of, you know, Hurricane Katrina or Sandy. So, so what happens next with much more money on the table really matters. And so, you know, we have to be following the state houses um, and look at the allocation process, which is not something that's especially sexy or fun, uh, no, obviously. No, but it's important. And then we have short-term memories, right, about these crises. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so we have a lot to be looking at. Um, Alex, we're going to turn it over to you. Sure, great. Well, thank you so much for the, the invitation to be here. Uh, as Eric said, I'm an assistant professor in sociology, and my research is about uh, public mental health care systems. Uh, in France and the US. And so I'll be talking about the implications of, of the pandemic for healthcare, uh, which I think interestingly, in a lot of ways, the pandemic has been less about healthcare than you would think. Um, but I do think there's some, some important lessons there. Um, so, you know, for a long time before the pandemic, you know, the, the chief thing on the, on the agenda for healthcare reform in the US was, was access uh, and addressing our, our scandalously high rates of uninsurance, which peaked at had a recent peak of 17.6% of in 2010 and dropped to 10% by the end of the Obama administration uh, and steadily ticked up uh, over the course of the Trump administration. Um, so when the pandemic started, both myself and I think you know, authors of op-eds that you could see, you know, really felt that this was gonna make a, a really compelling case for Medicare for all. So free single payer healthcare, uh, which, would, which would have improved you know, America's woeful response to the pandemic. Uh, you know, I think those arguments are very true, but when we look around the world comparatively, um, the story is not so simple. So there's simply, 
you know, there are countries with really great healthcare systems like France or, or Canada uh, that have not performed noticeably or particularly well during the pandemic. Uh, and countries that have universal healthcare systems that are, but are, which are chronically underfunded like that of Taiwan, uh, which have had really great results. Uh, you know, mostly these differences reflect factors that have nothing to do with medical systems, but social trust and compliance, government leadership, and the effectiveness of lockdowns, mask mandates, and physical distancing requirements. Uh, what I want to focus on today, though, is the other side of the coin, uh, which is to say one of the things that's been under-discussed because of our huge, huge focus on healthcare access has been healthcare provisioning. Uh, what kind of entities are actually providing the services that either private or public health insurance would be paying for? And here, I think the pandemic actually offers an incredibly clear lesson, which is that we need a robust system of public provisioning. Uh, when we talk about public health, we know that things like clean water or disease, disease monitoring are public goods that the private sector cannot profitably provide. Um, but the lessons of the pandemic reach far beyond this. So for example, we know the US spends more on healthcare than any other country as a proportion of GDP. Uh, but what, lets, what gets less attention is that we have a lot less basic health infrastructure. Compared to the OECD average, we only have 60% as many doctors and 70% as many hospital beds. This is partly because our privately run healthcare system is incredibly good at finding efficiencies, getting cheaper professionals like nurse practitioners or shortening hospital stays. What the pandemic reveals though, is that we actually in some ways need the inefficiency of the public sector. Uh, in ordinary times, we really need an underutilized stock of ventilators or manufacturing capacity to produce vaccines. We need hospital beds that are empty and we need nurses who are not worked, you know, to absolutely to the maximum. We need to have them waiting in the wings. Relying on the private sector to provide basic health infrastructure has ended really badly. Why in Italy did the Lombardy region, the richest in the country, and one where everyone is insured, run out of hospitals and ventilators? Part of the explanation, as the New York Times reports, is that in 1995, the province shifted to a market-based privately provisioned system, and specializations such as prevention, primary health care, outpatient clinics, and infectious diseases uh, declined significantly. Uh, as one neonatologist was reported, that is why we have a healthcare system very well prepared to treat the most complicated diseases, but completely unprepared to fight something like a pandemic. In the neighboring region of Veneto, a healthcare system centered on so-called community care in which family doctors and nurses made home visits performed far better. We're lucky in some ways that the pandemic hit first in a place like New York City, where a huge behemoth like the Health and Hospitals Corporation created a higher than average density of hospital beds. In rural areas, 120 hospitals have closed over the last 10 years, often after being purchased by private equity firms. There are no shortage of other places where you can see that having privately provisioned healthcare can be catastrophic in a way that a single-minded focus on unscrupulous insurance and pharmaceutical companies might leave out. Atul Gupta and colleagues at the NBER recently published a working paper looking at the acquisition of, by private equity firms of nearly 10% of America's nursing homes in the last 10 years. Patients spending time there after a period in acute care hospitals had 11% higher costs and a 10% higher death rate. Six peer-reviewed studies already show that for-profit uh, nursing homes in the US had higher death rates in the pandemic, and this has been shown for the UK as well. We know that the precarity of the nursing home labor force was a huge factor in the spread of the pandemic, as workers who pieced together work in multiple homes transmitted the virus between them. Unionized facilities fared much better. On the other hand, we're going to see positive examples where states that have focused on public provisioning have had superior outcomes. West Virginia was a dark horse leader in early vaccinations. And when I checked this morning, it's tied with New Mexico and, Sandy, uh, and South Dakota for having the most adults fully vaccinated, 13%. What did they do differently? Well, first off, the state government showed leadership in realizing that West Virginia was not like the rest of the country. It had been largely abandoned by the large pharmacy chains, CVS and Walgreens, that the federal government has used to vaccinate long-term care facilities elsewhere. So it turned to local pharmacies. Furthermore, it entrusted the National Guard with logistics. And while in other states, people signed up through concert ticket venues like Eventbrite, the state set up a single helpline for people to call. Yes, call, recognizing that many people don't have internet access. In short, while the public sector can be a source of enormous inefficiency, it also has a capacity for coordination and reaching unprofitable and marginalized populations uh, that the private sector can almost never provide to the same extent. As I wrap up, I want to you know, quickly mention a topic particularly near to my heart, which is mental health. Uh, recent CDC data points, points to a looming second pandemic of anxiety and depression. 
From January to July 2019, 11% of US adults screened positive for symptoms of anxiety or depression. In December 2020, the figure was up to 42%. In the year leading up to June 2020, so just capturing the beginning of the pandemic, overdose deaths increased by nearly 20% after two years of modest declines. In these kind of situations, our first question is always going to be, how do we get these people medical help? And my response is that we are not going to do it anytime soon. Even prior to the pandemic, mental health services in the US were enormously oversubscribed, particularly in the public sector. Among, even among people with severe mental illnesses like schizophrenia, one third of Americans are receiving no services whatsoever. So to address the second pandemic of mental health, we're gonna to need to look beyond the health system itself. It's a perfect time to realize that without addressing racial disparities that create trauma or economic disparities that generate stress, we will not make a dent in these enormous rates of mental health problems. So to sum up, yes, in any case, the pandemic makes a convincing, makes a case, uh, you know, we can find cases of people being hit with enormous bills or denied needed care uh, or made more vulnerable to COVID as a result of their lack of access to health care. Um, so yes, you know, the pandemic makes a case for, for Medicare for all. Uh, but I think the way that we frame this debate is at once both too ambitious and not ambitious enough. So although Bernie Sanders has popularized the Canadian model, not every wealthy country uses a single payer system where you know, the government is the sole insurance company. Uh, and many, internet, many, many international comparisons put Germany or the Netherlands, which have highly regulated private insurance companies on the top. Uh, there might be models uh, that are closer to our existing systems and we would have fewer hurdles to clear to replicate them and achieve, and achieve universal health insurance. Uh, and in that respect, uh, the massive increase in subsidies for purchasing uh, health care on the Obamacare exchanges that were included in the, the stimulus. It's not at all how I would imagine the most effective or efficient way to create universal health care access would be, um, but it's a much more straightforward way to getting that insurance number down, uninsured number down to 0% uh, without having to deal with some of the other uh, complexities of, a, of an overhaul of the health care system. At the same time, I think we're not being ambitious enough and that the pandemic is a wake up call that our agenda for healthcare reform after the pandemic needs to be thinking more about the supply side and what the unique role for the public sector needs to be in provisioning not just public health, but healthcare in general and a whole, whole host of public goods uh, that research on social determinants of health has shown is, is even more determinative of, of healthcare outcomes. So thanks again for the invitation. Well, th thanks, Alex. I'm, I'm really happy you could join us. And one thing you're making me think about are these proposals to develop something like some kind of you know national service civilian core to do you know post pandemic recovery uh frankly i was a little you know d disappointed we couldn't muster more of that during the pandemic or all the you know ways that um you know people could be engaged in community work but we had the, the wrong political leadership at the national level for that and of course you know we we, we could use that kind of work to, to deal with the next set of crises that we face um you know potentially from climate change because uh, we walk out of this uh, pandemic if we get there into a whole other set of issues where you know ra racial justice climate you know housing are all uh, you know at the top of that list i ju i just want to take advantage of your expertise on the mental health issue to ask you to drill down a little bit more on that though you you kind of made a point about the fact that we're not going to get adequate care for people who who you know uh really need it uh w given where we are now and where we're heading and I, I wanted to make sure I understood your proposal for how we deal with that situation. This is not an abstract matter. I mean, the consequences of the kind of mental health crisis that are looming, you know, are felt inside American families across the country, uh, you know, with particular concentrations in poor communities, communities of color, uh, and they're increasingly visible on uh, city streets and public spaces. I imagine this is really going to be an urgent issue. And uh, you know, I wonder if you've got ideas. Uh, you know, if you had the ear of a mayor uh, for how to how to go about it. Well, I think um, you know, New York City had this Thrive Mental Health Plan that was released in 2015. It's received a lot of of criticism, but I think some of the principles within it are going to be really important. So they think a lot about task shifting. That you know, America's mental health work workforce is is really too small to meet the need, and so long term. You know, absolutely, we do need, do need to be, you know, training more mental health professionals. Um, but we also need to be thinking about, you know, what kind of services and what kind of supports can be provided by non-professionals or lay professionals. Um, you know, again, I think our mental health system has both a problem of provisioning, but also a problem of allocation. 
uh, it's much easier for me to see a therapist regularly than a homeless person with schizophrenia to see a, a therapist on a regular basis. Um, and so I do worry um, that as we think about this enormous expansion of mental health problems, we really have to, we absolutely have to make sort of basic mental health services available, but we also have to be aware of, of cases where, um, you know, other kinds of interventions are actually going to be more effective. And we're not asking our, our mental health system to sort of pick up for problems that are really generated uh, by our economic, you know, by precarious work, by, you know, people, you know, not getting an, you know, an education by racial disparities. Um, I think that we often, we lean on our mental health system to do things that are in some ways to, to sort of, to, to compensate for other parts of our, our social safety net that are fraying. So I certainly don't want to be, you know, read as, as just, you know, saying, you know, getting medical help isn't, isn't helpful, but I think we're going to have to think more broadly and we're going to have to make really difficult decisions about prioritizing, you know, the existing resources that we have. Great. Well, I, the good news is I know Jean Paulo has a plan to address all those things. So uh, we're going to have Jean Paulo uh, take us home. He's the last speaker. Before Jean Paulo starts, I do want to invite those of you who have questions, who've been formulating questions, uh, you know, at any time now, if you want to use that Q&A function, the little icon down at the bottom of the screen, uh, you can you can start to do that now. You're you know welcome to do that as we go. Um, uh, and um, Jean Paulo, let me hand it over to you. Thank you so much, and so nice to be in conversation with you. I'm actually going to be returning to a couple of the things that have been said, and in a way, I suppose I'm going to bookend uh, Larue's uh, kind of finish Larue's thought about the role of policy uh, in this time. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this specific proposal we've been working on uh, with my colleague, Jake Carlson, uh, along with a, a team that consists of Sarah Dubisak, Marnie Brady, and, and uh, Ned Crowley on the Social Housing Development Authority. But I wanted to actually, uh, something LaRue said made me sort of wanna talk a little bit about what I think our role is at this moment as scholars and as critical scholars. So, you know, living through the pandemic and being in this moment has been interesting and kind of sobering for those of us who think of ourselves as critical or radical scholars. Uh, events unleashed all kinds of fast evolving demands from the beginning of the pandemic, like cancel rent and defund the police that were in dialogue with the very same theory that we write and teach. And yet we have struggled to respond to the kind of radicalism in the air in a meaningful way, I think. Um, I think you know, uh, in, in this occasion, just to think a little bit more broadly about what it means to be a public intellectual in this moment. You know, critical social sciences, of course, have a fraught relationship with desired futures. Critical sociologists are best when we look at the world for what it isn't, and we provide analysis for what that is. Our critical habits make our analysis better, more, more systemic, structural, fundamental, and they take us down to the roots of issues but we become uneasy and less confident on the way back out to somewhere else. We can name racial capitalism and private property as fundamental problems, but we stumble for, for alternatives. Simply stating the opposite of the problem, non-capitalism, non-racism, non-police is a slogan, but not an alternative. So what do we do then when the world is calling on us for something else, something radical perhaps, but something concrete and useful? If we can radically deconstruct, how can we radically reconstruct as well? Our leverage, our tools, any good for that? So with this group of people that I mentioned, we've been working, I think it's fair to say, in a kind of methodological utopianist sort of framework. This is associated with a former teacher of mine, Eric Olin Wright, but has a longer root in the work of W.B. Du Bois and others. Angela Davis has this very nice phrase when she's talking about abolition which he says, look, abolition is not only or even primarily about tearing down or undoing as much as it is about building up and creating new institutions. So to talk about abolition for her means also discussing and envisioning fundamental refoundation and reconstruction. And so it has been in this terrain, the terrain of the possible that I think is open for us at the moment is what I think we should be engaging. One of the things that was very interesting uh, in the course of the pandemic uh, besides the, the work of survival was the emergence of these kinds of like policy hooks. So hashtag cancel rent, 
hashtag uh, defund the police. These are interesting and they're kind of brilliant because they are specific, they're actionable, they are in, in principle winnable, you know, city governments defund things all the time, um, but they are fundamentally unreasonable. And their unreasonableness is what makes them interesting and generative of alternatives. You know, Paulo Freire, the Brazilian education thinker talks about the methodology of questioning. He says, you have a good question when your answer gives you more questions. So if we cancel rent, who pays the rent? Who takes care of landlords? What about other debts? What do housing courts do? What about the conditions of homes? And so on and so on and so on. These are winnable, but they take us down path of new interesting ways. Same with defund the police. Uh, I have to say, uh, I, I learned about this essay of W. Du Bois about the nature of intellectual freedom. And I was actually reading it uh, as the some of, as the pandemic hit, and he challenges us to kind of push beyond what this thing of our conception of what is mutable and immutable. You know, he says there is human effort, there's natural law, and there's gravity. But when we're talking about freedom and property, our inability to think beyond them is part of the problem. So this is the challenge we took up. Our process has been from the beginning, this group, we're engaged with advocates and social movements. And we, we, we've thought about different sort of lines of operation. And one of them was, okay, what would cancel rent look like? It's to kind of like give institutional and policy flesh to these radical demands. So we did an early memo in that and um, we actually managed to publish an op-ed about it and have continued to work in this vein, again, looking at demands for their end goal instead of starting with what's possible and thinking what's the better of the possible alternatives, actually forgetting that, what's desirable and how do we move in that direction? And so our, our most, uh, and this will be the last thing because I wanna have some time for discussion, where we've landed is this discussion of the social housing development authority so, you know, to echo what everyone has said, the emergency relief is important and it's fundamental and it needs to be done in a just way. It needs to be done better than it's been done so far, if you think about the people who've been missed by some of the rental programs. But we can't go back, uh, as uh, Ellen said, to the, the day before the pandemic, when there were, what, one million children sleeping in cars that night in the United States, right? We can't go back to that. So how do we think about this moment and how do we move in this other direction? So the Social Housing Development Authority is a, is a, is a plan uh, for essentially socializing housing. We, we want the, a very active public sector to play a role in preventing the transfer from uh, distressed properties to private equity, something which has been disastrous and will definitely be disastrous if it happens again, uh, hold these properties and finance the transfer to social sectors. So we think tenant cooperatives, limited equity cooperatives, community land trusts, uh, resident-owned communities, um, nonprofits. And this is part of a transition strategy to move us to a different kind of uh, housing system in which, you know, it, it might not be that we will have the Vienna, the Austrian model of 20% social housing. It may look very, very different, but I feel like we're at a moment where the cracks in this housing system, where its inadequacies are so blatant, so alarming, and, and so visible in the, in the wake of this crisis, that there's some room for us to begin to push the conversation that way. Um, and, you know, I, I can say that there is, there are, Eric said, there's legs to this. And, you know, we are engaged in a number of conversations with uh, different types of policy folks and elected folks. Um, yes, and, and we feel there is, is room to move that way. So I'll, I'll pause here so we have time to talk. Well, I, I appreciate the, the, the hard push. I, I, I wonder, Jean Paulo. If, if you could say a little bit more about what, you know, what is a vision for social housing? Because I, I think for a lot of people who are engaged in policy issues, 
uh, that's a concept even that sounds like it belongs to a different time or a different place. It just feels so far removed from, you know, the way that we've been talking about housing issues. Um, so what, like, is there a specific thing that you're pushing for that, you know, you want to share that we, we should understand better? Yeah. So, you know, for us, social, yeah, one of the problems is that social housing sounds, it sounds from a different era and it sounds imported from Europe, uh, which I think is actually not helpful. So I think Social housing for us means housing that uh, is non-speculable. So you cannot speculate on it. It's partially outside the market. Uh, we imagine there's gonna be a public subsidy or effort to get it started. And there's a strong element of resident control. I think the community land trusts we have across the United States, for example, are one model of social housing. We think though that it's important as this kind of effort takes off, that we recognize there's many different kinds of social housing. There's very nice limited equity cooperatives in Washington, DC, but we don't think that's necessarily what's gonna work in Jackson, Mississippi. But there are these kinds of like incipient models, again, where you know there's no speculation or limited speculation, there's resident control, and it's partially or fully outside of the market. There's an idea, look, there's a kind of ultimately a kind of public backing for this sort of thing. Got it. One of the questions that we have uh, from uh, Jim Dingman uh, is about the relationship between uh, kind of a kind of utopian theory that comes out of the constraints of the moment. You know, you talked about this Du Bois essay uh, and your, your engagement with you know, life on the ground, situations on the ground. And, and this is not, not, not for you, Jean-Paul, specifically, but for everyone, I, I, you know, I, I wonder how you think about this moment and kind of what your responsibilities for uh, kind of recognizing uh, the kinds of inequalities and the pain that are out there right now and the solutions that are on the table that have traction and seem like they're kind of ginned up to move quickly how do you how do you balance your kind of feeling like you, there's just a, an injury that needs to be repaired immediately with the kind of longer term big picture aspirations um, you know that some of you have called for and a, anyone can take this. Larue, we haven't heard from you in a little while, and this, uh, I know this is kind of the theme that you were sounding off on before. Yeah, you, you know, for me, I think, um, and I try to come from a tradition where we are pushing for things that are far outside of what is normal, normative, or even what people think is possible, right? And, and so, as you mentioned, folks like W.B. Du Bois, Ida B. Wells, right? They were literally fighting lynching while also writing about the value of arts and what it means to create community. In the same way, we have a moment where um, many people, when they hear of a problem, and, and the, you, you suggest an alternative framework, right? I'm an abolitionist, and they're like, well, wait, so what do you do about this, right? they always start in a problem framework and ask for a solution, not even recognizing their own framework and their own ideology never solve the problem to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. So you want me to tell you how we will disappear all police and your grandma will be safe. First, with all the police, your grandma isn't safe right now. So let's talk about what grandma experiences. Let's talk about what police do. And let's talk about what we want to build. So I love the possibility of the moment. I love that we're actually even getting in a place in the US and this has happened around the globe, but people are writing in ways publicly where we're engaging these ideas in real ways. I think about Bettina Love, right? We wanna do more than just survive. I think about Mark Lamont Hill, we still hear. I think about Miriam Kaba who now has a New York Times best-selling book, right? Until we get free, we do this. These are all opportunities for us to not only address what's happening, but really to push our thinking around our understanding of the world and the problems that we face. All of the people who intellectually inspire me, all the people who inspire me as an activist, all the people who just inspire me as a human, they made sure that they weren't limited by what was right in front of them. And if we remain locked in a framework of what is the perfect solution and what is the perfect policy, and I think Jean Paulo and Ingrid and Alex spoke to like, there is no perfect, right? This is but one realm, right? Because I want us to be advocating to cancel rent. I want people in the street doing rent strikes. And at the same time, working on legislation that creates the space that maybe there's some movement here, but it has to be both. Because oftentimes in this, uh, as is, is often the case, we have traded 
the bigger question and the bigger desire for incremental change and justice has never been incrementally delivered. That's interesting. A Ingrid, is there, is, there, is there something that's, um, is there something that's come up in the last year as a policy possibility that you never would have imagined uh, could be possible, something that feels kind of more transformative uh, than just kind of like moving the needle a little bit? Yeah, I mean, a couple things. I mean, one, I have to say, it's like it's also a matter of like how far you're moving the needle. So when I worked at HUD in the first six months of the Obama administration and worked on the, the, um, the Recovery Act then and fought really hard to get this, not that it was me only, I don't mean to be taking credit for this, but it was one of the things like fought really hard to get this $1.5 billion in, in um, the, uh, what is it, homelessness prevention and rapid rehousing. And that was like, that was such a victory, 1.5 billion. Okay, now over the last year, we have $50 billion in emergency rental systems. So I wouldn't say that's just like that. That's on the one hand, that's moving the needle, but it's moving the needle really far in a way I never would have imagined was possible. So I do think that they sort of, these crises um, shift what's possible um, for sure. It, it sort of changes frames and I think you should take advantage. And I guess I'll just echo, I mean, I do think it's important. I, I wouldn't see these things as sort of either or. I mean, I probably, I spend a lot of time thinking about kind of, incremental changes and I and I do believe in the value of incremental changes but I also think we need to be having these these deeper conversations um, to reimagine what's what's possible at the same time okay we have a thanks we have a question from Jake Schnape who is really for Alex and the question is about um, the relationship between frontline workers in the mental health space and academics and, and researchers and it's, again, it's about this kind of issue in some ways of like theory and practice and how embedded you are. It seems to me like, you know, Jake's concern is that there's this real separation right now between the academic research community and, you know, people who are dealing with, a, with this kind of struggle on a daily basis. Are you, you know, you're, you've only been in New York for a short time, but I wonder if you've seen things here that give you some sense that there's, uh, you know, some, something emerging that's exciting. Um, I have to say, I haven't. Uh, a lot of my work is is still in California. The sort of era of Zoom has allowed me to continue to do my research in California because uh, all the meetings are online, all the conversations are online. Um, I do think, like in the particular era area that I I work in, there's a real sort of uh, kind of desert of research of really trying to understand what's happening at the the core of the mental health system. And I talk to a lot of professionals who sort of feel that they have you know, they're sort of in a complete zone of almost invisibility in terms of the work they do. Um, you know, I'm kind of one of the things that I've been I've been talking about has been, uh, you know, we've talked about COVID as, you know, COVID has been disastrous for people living in institutions. It's been a disastrous for people living in prison. It's been disastrous for people living in, uh, in nursing homes. And kind of the third prong of that, that there's been less discussion of, it's been a disaster for people living in psychiatric hospitals, often involuntarily in group homes for people with developmental disabilities as a whole sort of largely unregulated or, you know, relatively invisible set of, of institutions there. And I think um, there's there's an important role for for research and sort of calling attention to that and looking at the common you know risks you know this sort of reaches back to Goffman but the risks of putting people in total institutions um, I don't know on the on the particular question of sort of re, you know researcher you know collaborations between researchers and practitioners I don't have as much experience with that and I haven't I haven't seen sort of a burgeoning of that kind of work with the with the pandemic. fair enough. So we have time for one last question. It's a pretty open-ended question from Leah Diaz. Uh, and you can all kind of give a version of it. And I think you, my take on Leah's question is that, you know, that we've talked about a lot of different social issues um, and we've kind of articulated a lot of big challenges. And I guess the way I would frame it for you is, you know, is there, is there a, a reason you have to believe that we really, this really is a moment where we could extend public goods, you know, change the way that we think about them, uh, deliver them. Does, does, I guess, does this seem to you like this is potentially a switching point kind of moment? You know, is this, are we moving out of one era where we've kind of thought about government policy in a certain way and into a different one where we're starting to invest in ourselves, uh, you know, more generously um, and with the kind of social concerns that John Paulo articulated so clearly. 
John Paulo, why don't we start with you and a- anyone who wants to take a swing at this can, and then we're going to wrap for the night. Well, I'll, I'll, there's this phrase that, you know, what historical time is it? You should always ask yourself, what historical time is it that you're acting in? It does feel to me like we're in a historical time where things are possible. In the realm of housing and housing advocacy, as it happens, this crisis has hit at the time when the housing advocacy movement has grown. You know, it, it's been growing for 10, 15, 20 years. So there's a lot of energy on that side. It does feel like the conversations that are happening are more open. And it, there's a feels there's a kind of possibility in the air. Also, and I think something Ellen said is actually is, is very appropriate, which is there's some way in which these things are not opposed to each other. You know, there's a kind of like, a big change is a common sense change. We have a system that doesn't work. We need to help people out on an emergency basis, but we can't be doing that all the time. And we have to be more resilient the next time a, you know, a crisis comes along, which is a matter of you know, not if, but when. So optimistic. Anyone else want to address this? Yeah, I, I think to second what Jean Paulo said, uh, we're we're in a special moment, right? So conversations and solutions that have been have taken 30 and 40 years to hatch are actually now being voted on, are actually now being discussed just like on the internet and on the street. So in that way, I am uh, very hopeful. But as as the boys would say, you know, not hopeless, but unhopeful, meaning that there are ways that these things can easily be derailed. But the fact that it took 30 and 40 years for us to get here, and I'll claim every victory, um, but every win is not always the thing that we have to celebrate. We have to actually remember those who have been left out of the conversation and who live the daily miseries that we fight against. I think that's a pretty good place for us to yeah. uh, LaRue, Ingrid, uh, Alex, John Paolo, uh, thank you so much for taking some time to uh, share your thoughts and uh, insight on uh, this part of the pandemic situation. Um, thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, we will put out an announcement soon uh, around our next event. I believe uh, the remaining events are on uh, the pandemic and protests. The pro- you know, Lou talked about the relationship between people experiencing this crisis at home, uh, isolated, distanced, a lot of uh, pent up frustration, uh, a lot of things revealed. And we're gonna explore the relationship between uh, this extraordinary uh, summer of uh, political activity and the aftermath, which I, to be honest, I don't think you can really understand this extraordinary uh, $1.9 trillion bill that was just passed outside of those movements uh, over the summer. They were fundamental. Um, and we have another uh, uh, event on uh, the future of cities. After the pandemic, you probably remember the first story about the pandemic is that they were the beginning of the end of cities. And now I think we have a very different story we tell. Uh, about what's happening. And then we're gonna have a, a panel on the kind of the future of social life, you know, our relationship to our screens, to other people face-to-face, you know, where do we go from here? Uh, thanks to all of you for being part of our conversation and I look forward to seeing you soon. Have a good night. Thanks for having us. Thanks, take care. Nice seeing everyone. Absolutely.